My name is Alfred Chelimo. And the only thing she forgot to say is that I'm the brother-in-law. <laughs> because I married a sister. And I thank God. And uh, by the grace of God. I really, really thank God because of God's doing in my life. Um, the other one I want to say is, um, even as we talk of corporate governance, I work in the corporate world. And uh, spe specifically in the cooperative movement. And talking of corporate governance is something I'm very passionate about because it, help us in, it helps us in our organizations or in any other place that you are in. When you are in business, corporate governance applies. When you are at home, it applies also. Because you are an employer. Are you an employer at home? How many people have you employed? You are a manager at home. You manage people. You manage your children. There are those who work under you. The house managers are under you. Therefore, you practice corporate governance everywhere. And when I was doing this, I wanted to know, because the topic that we are doing today is pursuing good corporate governance. And I wanted to find out what is to pursue. And I went to the Oxford Dictionary, which says it is to follow or to chase. To follow or to chase, seek, go after, track, and stalk something or someone. That is good corporate governance. It says to do what? To chase. Chasing means you go after it. You're running after it. Chasing. Literally, Kipchoge. You give choke good corporate governance. To pursue, you are running after it. You know that is the fastest man we have ever known for the 42 kilometers. And imagine you'd be running after corporate governance, quality. Chasing after something he does not see. But the ultimate goal is to win the prize. It can also mean to proceed along along or something like a path going along um, let me use this uh, corridor here you are walking along this corridor looking for corporate governance it also suggests to mean continuing effort to overtake reach or attain certain goals or objectives to overtake continuing effort to overtake to overtake pastor Kiprop, reverend Kiprop, when you are you are about to overtake you indicate isn't it you indicate you want to overtake. That is to pursue. You are pursuing the road, actually, when you are overtaking. Every, any one of us who is a driver, you are pursuing the road. You, you, are just, you just want to overtake. Something is just telling you, can you overtake this man? Because that person is maybe probably driving slowly, and you want to reach your destination faster. And in Kiswahili, this is what has made me even, I, I really laughed about it. It says, Pursue is kufatilia. You know, kufatilia. Ama fukuzia. Iyo si ya Kenya iyo. That must be in Israel ya Tanzania. Fukuzia andama. With the generation Z calling it saka. Oh, my, my friends. <laughs> Unasaka. You know, what is this to saka? You know, going after, you know, like generation Z. Telling us unasaka, nasaka kitu. You know, you are, kumbe you are going after it. But yes, as if you You know, some of us, we, we were born uh, the time when Sheng was not around. You know, you may be looking at us and you think I'm very young, but I'm old. You know, you, know you are old in your wakati uh, wako, isn't it? So, me ni mzee, kifiangu. But I may not be older than the, the wazee when you are pali. Even Deacon there. You know? And Generation Z calls it Saka. I have now known. We could have a kid who was on end up in a Saka Saka Nikit after. So, you know, and that's the case. And uh, I like it, and uh, I liked it when I saw it. <clears throat> it also generally means it's to try to achieve some, something over a given period of time. Now, this is professional. 
when you are looking for pursuing something, you are looking for achieving a goal or an objective over a given period of time. You can imagine the time that has been spread. It said you cannot achieve a goal or you can meet, you cannot meet an objective very shortly. Those of us who meet objectives very fast. So, inapotea haraka, Reverend Kiproma mesema hiyo. Inapotea haraka, ikija haraka, inaenda haraka. But now it says, looking to achieve something over a given period of time. And I again wanted to know what is this thing which is good. It is something that is desired or approved of having required standards or qualities. When you are in the corporate world, the first thing that you will want to be to show off, or you want to show, even I heard the CBF saying you want to showcase your, your, your products and services. What are you showing? You are showing something of quality that someone, when you see, it is desired of. You will want to admire it. You, you will want to go for it. Yesterday in the morning, I was, I was, I was uh, interacting with the youth. And uh, I jokingly told them, nowadays I'm very careful when I want to purchase a cloth for my wife. Because when you purchase that cloth, utambiwa kala kwanza, hiyo kala ndi ulikuwa na wana. You know, we are very careful as men. Because with the letter, you are gift, a gift, yes. Oh, thank you for the gift. But the kala, kala nayo. You know what I'm talking about? That is something of quality to that person. That person wants something which is of quality to her or to him. So as men and women of God, we are seeking something that is desired of or being approved with the right qualities. Therefore, what is corporate governance? It is the process of measuring how public institutions conduct public affairs, manage public resources, and guarantee the realization of human rights in a manner essentially free of abuse, corruption, with due regards to the law. That is corporate governance. When you do corporate governance without the regard of the law, I like corruption, Apple. Many of our institutions have been killed simply because people, people want to, they love to do things for themselves. Corruption. You want to be bribed so that you can offer a service. The Bible teaches us about good corporate governance in the Old Testament peer, in terms of relationship between the ruler and the people. You remember, in the Old Testament, the people had one-on-one -on -one relationship with their leaders, and the leader had a relationship with also with God. Therefore, the people or the rulers were held responsible by God for their actions. Yet the people were holding their leaders responsible for their actions. If you remember in the Bible, when Moses met God, when God gave him the Ten Commandments, instructed him and told him, take it to the children of Israel. Let each and every one of them follow it. But when he came down, what did he get? If we are reading our Bibles, what did Moses get when he was coming down with the Ten Commandments? He found the children of Israel doing what? And he got mad. He was very angry. What happened? The Ten Commandments were done what? And God, what did God tell him? No, I'm a teacher. I'm sorry. So, okay. So, <clears throat> What did God tell, what, what happened to Moses after breaking the Ten Commandments? Yeah? Okay, so we'll engage together. So therefore, God will hold us responsible as leaders, as a person, with our actions. The Bible also in the Old Testament shows us when relationships of trust were broken. 
and what were the consequences? It came with a consequence when that trust was broken. And in the New Testament, it highlights the relationship of Jesus Christ and his followers with the religious and civil society of the time, describing harassment and prosecution. Jesus was harassed. Actually, he was harassed many times. Carrying your own cross to be crucified. You can imagine such a scenario. And these leaders were happy about it. Many were laughing at Jesus and saying, let him carry his own cross. And when he was saying crucify him, their actions. Yet Jesus was the savior. He's our God. He's God revealed to us. In our text for today, and a story which I love so much to read. In the book of 1 Kings, 3 verses 7 to 15, but we'll, we'll, we'll center at uh, verses 9. The Bible says, Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in the place of my father, David. But I'm only a little child. I do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen. A great people, to numerous to count. So give your servants a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in, administ in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you wise and discerning hearts, so that there will, be never, there will never be, or there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Verses 13 says, Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. If you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you long life. Then Solomon awoke. You can imagine such a, Solomon was in a, in, uh, he was sleeping actually. You know this man was sleeping and he got a dream. And I know when I was when I, when I read this story and I was imagining how. When I dream myself, what will I be dreaming of? Probably I'll be dreaming of people chasing me at night. Probably you'll be dreaming of uh, someone cutting your head and placing it on a plate, and you start screaming at night for, for no reason, apparent reason, just because of that dream. But look at this man. He dreamed having communion with God, talking to God one on one. And God asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And he says, give me, give me, what? Give me what? Wisdom. And this man, God gave him. How many of us, when we are called by God, when, when God will come, in fact, I was imagining yesterday, I, I thought about it, I said, God, if you come, say, say, say. And, I, and I'm asked, what, you ask me, what do you, want me to, what do you want me to give you? How many things will I say? I wrote them down and I said, probably, I will say one, eliminate my enemies. <laughs> Secondly, give me money, wealth, prosperity, so that my enemies will see me. The third one I said, <laughs> and, and, and the, the, most, the most amazing one is, if God will ask us, even as men and Africans, sorry men, some will say, God, eliminate the rule that we, we marry one wife. <laughs> but I'm sorry, man. Why? Because we are supposed to adhere to what God has said. We are to marry one wife, isn't it? But what has come of us? When God bless you to your wife, you'll want to see another one. Look at Solomon. 
This is a man again we are told he had how many wives? How many wives? 300. 700 and how many concubines? 300. So you can imagine if you read this scripture here, Solomon, utakona ambia mungu mfanya mimi nikai kama Solomon. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, uh, and God told Solomon, I will not only give you what you have asked for, I will give you long life. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Imagine God giving me long life so that I can live and see even the children of my children and my children. You know, having such a life as a Christian, even as we talk of the issue of corporate governance. From this we learn that Solomon recognizes God's goodness and his faithfulness to the children of Israel. God noticed his humility because he did not ask for God to kill his enemies. And actually remember, the children of Israel had many, many enemies. Many enemies, but Solomon did not want to, to ask God to do that, to eliminate them or kill them. He asked for one thing, wisdom. And when God had given this man wisdom, something we call in the corporate world, ethical dilemma came up. Ethical dilemma? Dilemma. It came up. Women came. They had given birth, and one of them slept on the child. Oh God, help, help, help our mothers. She slept on the child, and she brought before Solomon and said, Hey king, this woman stole my child from me. Now this one is dead, it's us. And this one that is alive is mine. King, make a ruling. It's the called dilemma. Come and wear on Gafanyaji. Elder Wambua, Ungafanyaji, Bila wisdom, Yenimunga Mekup, Ingewa Gum, Ningumusan. But this man, because God had given him wisdom, he said, Now, both of you are claiming for the child, the, 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 the on, on, his ownership, to the same ownership you am told, isn't it? But Zababu Wotu Wamekuja. Both of them said, The child is mine, probably they were pulling the child. In fact, the child, maybe Angewa Mekua torn apart. But then, God, the Solomon said, Mulete kisu. Edical dilemma. Let a nini kisu. To pursue him to Marangabi, so that all of you will go with the other half, you take, the other half, you, you also take. And definitely the mother of the child will not have allowed the child to die. And the other one said, yes, king, do it. They are in business, do it. And the other one said, no, 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 king. Let her take the child. And God who gave Solomon wisdom told him, told them, now, ma'am, this is your child. Ethical dilemma. I talk of ethical dilemma in our work today lives. Because of our time, I may not follow this light. Ethical dilemma in our day-to-day -day lives. When we are faced with a situation that is compromising our faith, what will you do? What will I do? Will you declare it and say, I have an interest here? The ethical dilemma that we always have faced, even in families, is when you are visiting your, your, your in-laws. I'm sorry. Your in-laws, my in-laws, when I am going to my in-laws and my, my wife goes to my uh, in-laws, who are my, my people, and I'm going to their people, there is something that happens. You will realize by the volume of shopping that you do, <laughs> that shows your heart. But you find people in the supermarket, I'm sorry, I'm a very observant person, though I'm silent, kidog. Unafika supermarket, watu anapingana. Sasa wewe ulipepa kwa mama hako mingi na unapepa kwa yetu kidogo. Sasa wewe ulipepa. Ethi kwa dilemma watu wana kwa sana kwa supermarket. Simply because they have not agreed on what to do. Ethi kwa dilemma. Ask God for wisdom as Solomon did. God gave him wisdom. And on top he added him more things. He gave him wealth. He promised him long life. Oh, I pray that God will come through. 
for all of us this morning. The book of Genesis, even as Solomon was asking for wisdom, God was talking to the early man and warning him, or warning, uh, yes, he wanted them that he may not take or touch the fruit of the tree that has the fruit of life. Because when they do it, they will what? They will die. Why? Because they will have known the truth. You know? The Bible says in Genesis 2 verse 17, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge and good, of good and evil. When you eat from it, you will surely die. When you compare this and check on it, man had been warned by God not to eat from the tree of knowledge, for if he does, he will die. And because God knows us, he knows from the beginning to the end. In fact, God knew. He knew, he knew that Shaitan had a Pastor was telling us the other day, the devil is very wise. Who told you the devil is stupid? He's very wise. He's a very bright man. The devil, as Pastor Kipropo was telling us the other day, he knew, definitely I will tempt these people, and God knew he will come to tempt them. And he told them, you know, God has told you what? Not to touch this one. Like, when you do it, you'll be able to know. Yeah? You will know these things. And surely, men did. You know? And they had been warned by God. Imagine, imagine, imagine Elder Mambua. And I'm sorry, I'm referring to you so quite often. Imagine Elder Mambua telling your son Alpha not to do something. Now, indeed, anajua kweli nigifanya nimbaya. But something will come along the way, which will they do it? You definitely what to what What will happen to you as a man? First one, you'll be very furious at the, the boy. But God, when he appeared before, before them, wakauliza, where are you? They are what? We are naked. Who asked them about their nakedness? But God wanted to know where they are. Because they had, take, they had eaten from the, <laughs> the fruit, the tree. That gives them knowledge to distinguish between good and evil. The moral part of man was tested. God had warned them not to eat from the tree. But they ate it. Instead, they chose to disobey God and listen to the devil. How many times... Have we heard God speak to us? Not to do it. There's something you feel like you want to do, but some way God comes and says, don't do it. Either you find yourself sweating, I'm on a tetemega, but you proceed doing it, and the consequence will be dire. The disobedience of man not about knowing good and evil. And here, the penalty of death was realized and effected. From where I work, when you say you effect something, nukwakikisha imefanyika, you know? And surely men, from that time, we were cast. The woman was told, you will do what? You will what? You will bear children. And then you talk about the woman and the man. The woman is not good, isn't it? And that is why even the army, when, when the military, when they are going for, to war, they must wear boots and you go to so that they protect themselves from snakes. You have never known. Have you known, had you known that? The reason as to why these guys wear boots because they are protecting themselves from the snake so that they are not beaten. But then God had warned these people and told them, Mom, you will be beaten by the same snake, the serpent, that tempted you. And then man, you will toil. That is why you find us running every day, driving like crazy, because we are looking for something that we disobeyed God. You can imagine without that sin, where will, how will life be today? I'll tell you what you enjoy life. You know? But then the consequence of our sin, 
And that tree represented us having the right relationship with God. The tree of life represented us having the right relationship with God. And therefore, for us to pursue good corporate governance, we must strive to have the right relationship with God. The book of Matthew 6.33, the Bible says, But seek ye first, or seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and what? And all these things shall be added unto you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these other things will be added unto you, surely, my brothers and sisters. Some of us are seeking for ways of getting money. But without God, utapata na imko nyingine na inapitia kwa hii, kwa na nyingine. Sitakuwa zinapepea. Because you have not you are not seeking God. You are not involving God in whatever you do. This is Jesus. He called us to seek first the kingdom of God instead of worrying of the earthly desires which are temporary. I know we are to accumulate as much wealth as we can. But then without the gift of the Holy Spirit and the, the, the gift of eternal life, is of it is to watch. The other day in my village, there was a road which was on, a, on dispute. And I was called by old men in the village and said, my, my friend, Shambayago imelimu wa katikati, and all your bananas are down. And I, I, I told them, okay, uh, nanini ingine, ata maembe pia iko chini. Oh, maembe ilisha, eh. And mungina nanembe, and the way you maembe ilikuwa imeshika. You can imagine, na vile yu maembe ilikuwa ime, imeshika. And then I asked them, so what do we need to do now? Come and intervene, my brother. Come and intervene. He is unfair. You know, and I, you know, they're making me like, and I told him, my brother, God gave us that land. It's God who gave us the land. And it, it's of no use to me now, actually. Because I'm there, I'm, I'm, I'm not there. My embe, yes, my embe, yes, my embe, yes, like, what do I do? My neighbor was to have a road. Actually, people called him in the village, the landlocked man. And, and, and I don't know why God chose me that my land will be taken over. And when I went to the village and I told these guys now, because you've used this one, now I'll go to the other end and Muchimbe Vizuri Sasa, so that uh, this man can have an access road. And someone came and told me, Are you mad? Are you mad? And I told him, No, I'm not mad. My neighbor needs to, to have an access road. And in effect, I told these guys, The Bible says you love your neighbor as you love yourself. Do we often do this? Ama ni wewe ni ule kuku ikiingia kwa shamba yako unachukua panga kwa sababu ya kifaranga. You want to cut someone because of chicken. May God help us. Seek give us the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added unto you. I can tell you my brothers and sisters. Where that machine passed through. See I was told ilijimba banana yote. The other day I went there and I found all the bananas that had come again. You can imagine. Zimemea tena. Na actually zimemea vizuri zaidi. But it's as if you. Why? Because I did not worry about anything. And I, I gave them, in fact, the, the best road to use through my shamba again. That is the pure Christianity that we are talking about. Seeking the kingdom of God first. And all these other things will be added unto you. Do you want to get married, my brother? Seek ye the kingdom of God first, and a good wife will come your way. But it's as if you. Do you want the promotions? Seek the kingdom of God. Seek God first. And that promotion will surely come. You need not to bribe anyone for a promotion. Seek ye God first. You need not to say, you know, you need not to bribe anyone for anything good to come your way. Seek the kingdom of God first. But yes, as if you <clears throat> how can we achieve this like seeking God? How do we achieve it? Through prayer. Prayer. Prayer, prayer, prayer. You pray. Pray. The Bible says, Jesus said, pray continuously. Pray without ceasing. 
Call on God every minute. When you are faced with a challenge, call on God. Through praise and worship. Praise and worship. You know, when these guys were singing, you feel like, you, you, I felt like heaven has come down. Indeed, when you call on God exaltation, praising God, calling on him to come, if we, just imagine when you come to church and there is no praise and worship. How will it be? No praise and worship. Muna ingia tu, Reverend Betronina Nakuja, first time visitors, welcome in Jesus' name. Then preacher Nakuja, ana ubiri, ana love, nezemu ayam. Sasa service imeisha muende nyumbani. <laughs> you'll never, you'll, you'll, you'll feel like you have not come to church. But praise and worship brings the heavens down, calls God to come and be in our midst. Through repentance, leave what God has prohibited and return to what God has commanded us to do. Just like Genesis, in the book of Genesis, what we've just said, avoid what God has told you not to do. When you are told not to touch, don't indeed touch. Just like a person who is not an electrician. And you are told you don't touch electricity. It will electrocute you. What will happen? <laughs> Doubt. And that is God. God is telling you do not go this direction. You know, you'll just get into a ditch. And Pastor Gibro will come and, bring, and, and pull you down, pull you out of the ditch. Even these elders will come. We need to seek God. Repent. Let us repent. The book of Matthew 3, 2 says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The kingdom of heaven has come near. And we are told even in the Bible, we are told, what are the signs of uh, the, the nearest to, of Christ coming? Kutakuwa na vita, kila mahali, nja, you know, are we seeing these things? Are we seeing them? Yet we are still ignorantly following the devil. Tunafuata tu shetani pole pole, unapika story na ye pole pole. Unakuambia, oh, nduku yangu, bado uko sawa. Hata yesu bado hako mbali, na ye unazema ni sawa. Tuwaja mini endele, sawa. Delea. But then, the Bible says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is, has come near. When, the, when rapture comes today, or when the door is knocked, are you ready? Are you ready to, to welcome God? Are you ready to welcome Christ? Even as we seek these corporate covenants. <clears throat> the concept of corporate covenants is not new to us and the world today. It is as old as human civilization. Yeah? And according to the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific, uh, UNESCOP, Good governance is participatory, consensus-oriented, transparent, effective, and efficient, equitable and effective, and follows the rule of law. So for good governance to be effective, it must be participatory. People will love to participate. Consensus-oriented, a consensus must be reached. Responsive, effective, and efficient. There's someone I, I really admired, Kovi Anan. When he came to Kenya to mediate, when we had a, an issue, God used him to deliver our nation from going to the trenches. But there's something that he said. He said, good governance is ensuring respect for human rights and the rule of law. Strengthening the democracy and promoting transparency and capacity in public administration. Public administration. Are we following the law? Do we respect human rights? Hmm? Do we respect human rights, even in our place of work? Allow me to speak in Kiswahili. When Sizin Wale was saying, I'm going your staff will keep quiet. Yeah? And yet we are, we are saying we are, we are Christians. 
You get to the office, people get silent. No, there is something wrong. No, there is something wrong with you. Because you are not, actually maybe you are not together. Yet in good governance, we are to participate together. Live together in harmony in an office. Love each other. As the Bible encourages us to. As we quickly look at the principles of, of uh, good governance, one is participation. All, both men and women, are to participate in every activity that is going on in an organization. To a segregation, let us not segregate people and say this is a woman, this is a man, or this is a man's job, this is a woman's job. No, let us all participate. It is very, very important. The second one is the rule of law. This requires that fair legal frameworks be enforced impartially. It also requires human protection and properties and consensus oriented. Our equity and inclusiveness, every society's well-being depends on ensuring that all members and stakeholders feel included in the mainstream society. All members of the society feel inclu inclusive, included. Effectiveness and efficiency, I'm just rushing through because of time. How effective are our processes in our organizations? When you get into an office where a Christian is seated, will you wait for one hour to be served? Allah wa nagudia nakwambia buwana asiviwe customer? Right? I come and tell you, praise the name of the Lord customer. Are you okay? And you have sat, sat there for one hour. I'm not okay. You've kept me for one hour, surely. And you're asking me you praise the Lord. Efficiency and effectiveness in, the organiza in any organization that we are working in. Ensure when a customer comes in, you serve them very fast for the effectiveness of that organization. Whether you are business, whether at home, you know, whether in school, you are doing that. Be efficient and effective. Serve customers and clients very effectively. All stakeholders should be served and feel they are served well. They also have things to do, these customers of ours. They have things to do. They have not come there to, to, to sit down and stay. Accountability. <clears throat> Let us hold ourselves responsible for our actions. Accountability. And also we should be all held accountable to the public and all stakeholders. Wherever you work, other in business, when you are selling your wares, know that the public will hold you accountable for what you say. The book of Matthew, Matthew 12, that 6 to the 7, the Lord will keep us accountable for the words we speak. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for an empty word that they have spoken. For your words will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. The words that we speak every day, when a customer walks into your shop and you tell them something like, Unapata pastor, unafika nambia, pastor reverend, buwana asifiwe sana, he quote in year 3,500. El diko na anawalk in, na agujui, unamambia he suit in year 5,000. Are you accountable? You will be held accountable. You are not very, you are, <laughs> you are not doing the right thing. Actually, you are doing the wrong thing. Because you know reverend Giprop, unamuzia the factory price. You do not know Elder Deacon uh, Arena, you are selling him at a retail price, 5,000. Then you are selling this other one, 3,500. I will want to conclude. conclude by just mentioning an ethical practices that are in an organization. An ethical practices that we can see every day. One is discrimination. Do we discriminate against other people? Someone you do not know, just as I've said, harassment. You harass people from left, right, and center every morning. The most dangerous one in Kenya today is favorism and nepotism. You are an interview, you call people for an interview, and you already have determined, you already have determined what 
or the person you are going to hire. Yet you have called a thousand people to come for the interview. Nepotism. You have called a thousand people. And where would you do? Where where would you do? Me, me, ni tandika elda wambua. Like you know, a thousand people have come from all the way from even Mombasa to Eldoret. Na una juwa ni filecha wako na enda kumandika. It's wrong. Let us be held accountable for the things that we do. God will always, and, and I, I always told even my wife, Sazikina, Munga kifungua tu siku mwaja kate ni hivi. Na yonagani vitu seje tunafanya. You will want to run, but you know you don't know you will hide. Because of the things that we do. Nepotism. As we sang that song which says we are the sultan of the earth. In conclusion, even in the corporate world, let us make Christ known. Even from our mission and vision of the church. To know him, to know God. Let us know him every day. Make him known every day. Preach the gospel to those who have not been preached. Let us grow in Christ. Grow every day in Christ. You grow through him. Read these scriptures. Read the scriptures. Read the word of God every day. The book of Philippians 2, verse 12. You can go and read. Philippians 2, 12. Let us continue reading the word of God. Let us serve Christ. Serve him from your office. Serve him. When a drunkard gets into your office, will you chase that person away or witness him, witness to that person? to be saved. Share Christ. Make him known. The book of Mark 16, 15 says, and he said to them, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Do we do it every day? Do we do it even from our workplace, from our offices? Let us pray that God will help us to preach the gospel. Let us pray that God will help us even in our institution to illuminate the light of Christ to shine the light of Christ in whichever place that we are in.